Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Five Strategies to Thrive COVID-19, presented by Dr. Julie Reck. My name is Dr. Rachel Abrams, and I am the Fear Free Certified Practice Manager. Tonight's webinar will be recorded and will be posted on the Fear Free Pets website. I would ask that if you have any questions, please use the Q&A window to type those questions, and we will be able to address them upon the conclusion of Dr. Reck's discussion. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Julie Reck, founder and owner of the Veterinary Medical Center of Fort Mill, a five doctor, small animal practice just south of Charlotte, North Carolina. Like many of you, she's a working mom. She has a four-year-old son named Colt at home with her. She is also the author of Facing Farewell, How and When to Decide Euthanasia for Your Pet. So without further ado, Dr. Reck, uh, please take it from here. Thank you so much, Dr. Abrams. It is a pleasure to be part of this discussion here tonight. And I hope a unique discussion. Um, one of the things that I hope to bring to this is some familiarity and even sympathy, um, because I am not an industry figure that's going to talk about what I think you should do. I am in the trenches with you. I am working 10 hour days. I am treating patients. I am trying to lead my practice through this really difficult time. I you know, am also in the point where my back is against the wall too. And I've got 35 people that depend on their livelihood from my practice. So I got asked to do uh, a webinar last week. And when I was thinking about what exactly the content would be, I found that it was shifting every day what I wanted to talk about. Um, and all of this is changing so fast that what I ended up settling on was basically giving you guys my playbook for really how I'm getting through this day to day. And thus far, and we are truly taking it day by day right now, but thus far, uh, my practice is in a place right now where we are thriving and not just surviving this encounter. And I think that the five strategies that um, I'm putting myself mentally through, I'm putting my leadership team through uh, on a daily basis are really the keys to our success. Um, I, I also find a little bit comfort in remembering that this is not the first time in history where um, we have been in troubled times and, and that we've literally had our back against the wall. Um, so I love this quote um, because we need to remember that success is not always guaranteed and that's important. Uh, we also need to remember that if things aren't working out perfectly, it doesn't mean that it's completely the end. We can have a bad day, we can have a bad month, um, and we can still move forward with that. But really just putting one step in front of the other um, is what's important. And I love this Winston Churchill quote from that. It also just helps me remember to be present and just get through this one day at a time. So again, we're gonna talk about five key components that are walking through. And the first component is safety. Um, I'm gonna be talking about these components in a particular order because I actually walk through this mental journey on a daily basis myself. Um, I know many of us on this webinar are fear-free certified professionals. We may even be operating fear-free certified practices. And this is something we are familiar with thinking about all of the time when it comes to the mental well-being of our patients. You know, how safe is that? Are we protecting that? Um, and when it comes to leadership, way even before this whole COVID nightmare, this component of bringing safety to the team is a cornerstone of leadership. And if I were to be doing a webinar six or eight weeks ago, I would be talking about safety, but I would be talking about it in a standpoint of, do you have a team that feels safe to talk to you? 
do you have a team that feels that they can bring up concerns, that they can voice concerns? Do they get to practice in an environment where if they made a mistake, it would be okay? Not in the standpoint of we're going to forgive if, if there is a negative consequence to a patient, but are they in a learning environment where they can be nurtured, where they can grow and develop, or are they in an environment where they actually have to um, protect themselves and try to cover up any weaknesses or mistakes, and uh, which is leaving it impossible for them to think about how can I best support this patient? How can I best support this doctor? How can I give my best to the practice? So that's what I would have talked about from a safety standpoint about six weeks ago. Um, of course, the picture on here is Simon Sinek. He is a thought leader in leadership in business. Many of you might be familiar with him. I mention him in a lot of my lectures that I do um, when I'm just talking about Fear Free um, because his advice just resonates. He has a eight minute YouTube video on why good leaders make you feel safe. If you haven't watched that, it is an excellent, excellent thing to watch. Um, because now this question takes on a little bit different meaning. And the truth of the matter is, I and you cannot create a safe environment right now for our staff. You cannot guarantee that there is no risk to them being at work. But we can come together as a group and think about how can we as, be as safe as we possibly can be? And this is something we've got to ask ourselves on a daily basis right now. When we, this, oh God, 12 days ago, 13 days ago, I'm starting to lose count, um, but I was starting to see the handwriting on the wall really fast on, whoa, this is getting out of control. It hadn't wreaked havoc on our state yet. There was no restrictions. There was nothing from our governor about it. But in just seeing what it was doing in Seattle, what it was doing in New York, I would ask this question, how, oh my gosh, how can we help our staff feel safe right now? So some of the strategies that we've implemented are going completely curbside. I'm sure a lot of practices are doing that already, um, but there's lots of little steps to doing that well and doing that safely um, and making sure um, that we continue to ask this question to ourselves every single day because there's going to be new challenges that come, come up. We did this, we went curbside where there was absolutely no clients in the building with the exception of euthanasia we are still doing that right now in our practice. And to be honest, I'm not sure if that is right or wrong, but we just can't mentally separate ourselves from that right now. But about three days into this, the question came up, oh my gosh, a client needs to use the bathroom, can they come in? Went back to asking myself this question. I'm trying to play an odds game here. We are in a very, very serious situation where we're trying to balance being available for the needs of these pets and these patients and trying to keep staff healthy and safe. And right now, it is not worth that risk. So no, the answer is no. They cannot come in to the building to use the bathroom. They are welcome to leave the pet with us, they can go to return to their homes, that's probably the safest thing that they could do, or they can use a different open public facility, but they cannot use ours. Um, so, you know, thinking about this, how can we make our staff and clients feel safe? It's also important with all the questions that I'm gonna pose with these five strategies, it's, a, it's really important to realize you don't have to have all of the answers. You really just have to have the question. It is so powerful when we can come together as a group and we're gonna come back with so much better ideas and so much better engagement to make those ideas effective than if we feel like this is all on the shoulders of one or two people in our organizations. So 
Another strategy that we've done that I'll talk about in a minute is that we've also broken up into two completely separate functioning teams. We have team, they're not fancy named, team A and we have team B right now. Um, we are not engaging with each other socially across these teams and we are physically having massive uh, cleaning within the entire building in between the shifts of these two teams. Now that is not something that I elected to do, just hold up in my office saying, okay, guess what? We're gonna have to do this and you're gonna like it or you're gonna hate it, but it's what's happened to you. It was something that I actually brought to our seven person management slash leadership team. I emailed them um, actually a couple screenshots from um, some Facebook groups where I had just started to see this idea circulate. And it was funny because when I emailed it to them, just said, hey guys, just my job is to keep a feel on what's available to us. This sounds a little extreme. I'm not sure if I, we need to do this. <laughs> Again, this was probably about nine days ago. <laughs> um, and they had, you know, I said, let just take 48 hours to think about this um, and let me know what you think. Within about 36 hours, they all wanted to do a um, Zoom conference call on a Sunday to talk about this. They felt this is a really important discussion. And all we got through on that Zoom call was that it was an idea that we wanted to bring to the entire staff. So the next day we held an all staff meeting. If you were off that day, we just had people call in or FaceTime in, um, but we had all 35 of us. And we talked about this very thing, about breaking up into two physical separate teams. And is that something that would enhance our safety? Does it make us better positioned to survive this as an organization? And should we do it? And they all, we voted on this. So again, with all of the questions that I'm gonna pose and all these strategies, it's not critical that you have the answer. And we might have different answers within our practices. And that was a big part of how I wanted to formulate this content. I'm an open book. I will tell you guys anything that we are doing. Uh, and if it helps you, that's wonderful. But we're all in different parts of the country. We, this is even different from county to county in my state right now uh, about the level of measures that you need to take. Um, but what's not different is how can we work through this decision making and how can we lead well in this process here. So once we think about safety and we really ask ourselves that on a daily basis here, next is agility. And this is really, really important right now. If it's, if it's an area that's been a weakness for your practice, you're probably feeling it. Um, it's something that I would say we were pretty agile as an organization, but we've learned to be even more agile with that. Um, so this question, what are you doing to help your practice be agile and decisive? Um, I've never ever in 10 years of practice ownership been in a situation where I've had to make so many decisions so quickly and also enact them that quickly. Uh, so it's been a really difficult time. And if you're, feeling like I am, which is a, a little bit exhausted of the decision fatigue, that's really, really normal right now. Um, and if you feel overwhelmed by it, that's normal too. Um, but um, it is going to be a strategy for success with this. I've got a couple things that um, we've been working on being really agile with. And, um, you know, I already mentioned that we're 100% curbside in our practice. I mentioned that we broke up into two separate teams. And I even described how we were agile in that decision-making, right? This was something that I saw as, as our practice owner. I am part of, you know, probably 25 Facebook groups related to veterinary medicine. And I saw kind of a chatter about this idea and said, need to, need to at least expose my team to that on the leadership end the leadership end gets a chance to weigh in and then we bring it to the entire staff. So we were able to go, um, I sent that to them Friday night by Monday afternoon. We were decided by the entire team by a 100% unanimous vote 
and I don't think it matters if it was unanimous or not, but that everybody got a chance to vote, um, whatever the majority is. But by from Friday to Monday, we were able to be that agile with this. Um, another concept that is really important for us to be agile on is telemedicine. Right now, we are not fully enacting telemedicine. We are, um, again, the, both the teams are physically healthy. We do not have anybody that is um, under concern or under quarantine or anything like that. Also, we um, are still having quite a bit of physical demand for emergency and urgent care, um, but we are prepared. Um, we actually have kind of a task force that is working on how we can flip a switch and implement telemedicine. Um, so again, when I uh, mentioned that this doesn't all have to come from one person in the practice, you can take um, anybody who has some um, technical savviness. They could be a receptionist, they could be a kennel worker, they can be a technician, it can be an associate doctor. Um, in fact, maybe a, an individual from each of those departments would make an excellent, excellent task force. But say, you know what, right now we are actually, uh, the leadership is working really hard on the day-to-day -day operating procedures because those are changing so dramatically. We would love to have a group of three to five individuals that can really focus on what our telemedicine options, you know, if we need to really enact that, what platforms would we use? And there's a variety out there right now that are offering, you know, two, three months completely free. Um, I think AirVet and Babelbark are offering that right now. Um, there is also a brand new Facebook group that just launched last week um, that uh, was started by um, Dr. Jessica Vogelson. And I think it's really simple. It's just veterinary telemedicine group. Um, but there's a tons of amazing content. So um, I think it's really important that we brace into this um, because maybe you're already there with your practice. Maybe you have a doctor that's in quarantine and this is now the only way that that doctor can generate income or um, see patients through that. Um, it's also maybe the only way we're gonna actually be able to help any of our clients that they themselves are quarantined through telemedicine. So that's really important. Um, the next blurb I have are for um, the individuals that are watching that are actually the business owners. Um, and last Friday, the bill passed and the CARE small business loans. This is something that you really, really need to look into. Um, you know, and we're looking into, we haven't actually hit any kind of loss in revenue just yet. Um, and, but I don't know that that will be sustainable. None of us know how long this is gonna last. And we also don't know how deep unemployment is going to um, encroach on our communities. So if 40% of your community suddenly becomes unemployed, I'm not sure that we're going to have the same demand for the veterinary care. Um, so this is something that we are looking at, even though immediately right now, I technically might not need it to make payroll. Um, it's still really, really important to begin that process. Um, so the starting point with that is actually going right to your normal business lender, um, and they should um, have some of the SBA information for you on that. Um, another area to be agile on is, you know, hours of operation, whether that be um, your actual physical hours that you're open. My practice has traditionally, for the last seven years, been open from 8 until 10 p.m. on weekdays, Monday through Friday, and 8 to 6 on Saturday and Sunday. When we went curbside, and particularly when we went to the two separate teams, we just went 8 to 6 Monday through Sunday. Because frankly, right now, evening hours don't really matter. No one's working. <laughs> it doesn't have the value add that it used to have. And um, particularly with the curbside, with the exchange of the pet in the car and, and uh, the risk that that could have to our patients, we feel that doing that during daylight minimizes that. Um, so again, 
this concept of just being agile and being able to, um, you know, you were going left and now we need to pivot right um, and have your business be in that position and your leadership team be in that position, I think is really important. Um, and we're, we're getting better at being agile every single day <laughs> at the Veterinary Medical Center of Fort Mill. So um, we, I don't think we were perfect at it or maybe as good as I would have thought we were, but we're getting better. And um, it's something we can all work on daily as well. Third thing is communication. I know that this is a trite word, it's overused, but it's really, really, really important. Um, and, you know, we've considered the safety of our staff, of our clients. We've made sure that our business is thinking in an agile manner. Now we need to be really, really well positioned to communicate all of these decisions and changes that we've implemented in order to enhance safety. Okay. Um, and I have to remind myself of this all the time because it feels like we were clear. It feels like we said it. Say it again and say it again and say it again. Particularly when it comes to our interactions with the clients right now. This is um, just a couple blurbs actually just to help me remember to explain how we are communicating to our clients. So um, in the right-hand corner, there's a screenshot from our social media page. That's me. I have done multiple videos where I physically uh, speak through and walk through all of the changes. A little blurb onto why we are doing those changes. Some, some of that is actually very, very obvious now, but nine days ago or eight days ago when I filmed it, it was not as obvious. And really important for clients to understand, why are we breaking up into two teams? Why are we reducing the hours? Um, throw a little bit of why in there with that. Um, I like video because you can type something all you want, but you're not getting the body language. You're not getting the voice tone. And those things really, really matter, um, especially when we're talking about situations as critical as what we've got dealing with now. Um, so, for each major change, now that was curbside, that was probably about 15, 16 days ago for us now, and then um, probably about nine days ago for us on uh, splitting up into two separate teams, but those were two really big changes for us. Um, we did send an explanation email to all 6,000 of our active clients. Um, we also have emails that get automatically sent out upon appointment confirmation and such. So we were e able to easily update um, a little template of some of these changes about how they can be a, a helpful part of this curbside process to us. Um, of course, I just mentioned our social media and that is really, really important um, and super easy to keep updated. But another thing that's been extremely helpful, I have it in bold, is that two hours prior to every appointment, a client automatically gets a text. And that is really helpful because we're getting a lot of same day appointments right now, which means they're not gonna get the email 24 or 48 hours prior to the appointment, but they are gonna get an, another text two hours before that just says, explains the curbside, explains that they're gonna pull up to the hospital, they're gonna stay in their car, they're gonna call. Um, I have helped a lot of practices deal with the anxiety or actually the real issue of handling clients that are very upset about all of these changes. And the running theme behind all of this frustration is that, that clients ultimately were not communicated well. I'm not saying that the practice didn't try, and they might have actually been doing a fairly good job, but it still fell on deaf ears. The clients didn't hear it or didn't understand it. And that's why we've got to say it again and say it again and say it five different ways. Be very, very clear. So our, our text, it's not a lot of words. It's very, very simple, but it, it, they definitely are not shocked by the fact that they are not going to walk into this building and be face to face with the doctor um, at this point in time. Also on the phone, every time we're speaking to them on the phone, making sure that they understand 
what is going on. Um, also, uh, on the phone, this is our opportunity to really begin to reassure them that while it is very different as far as our human to human interaction, what their pet is going to be experiencing has really not changed much at all, um, especially as fear free certified professionals, where the emotional well being of that pet during this visit is of utmost importance. So the phone is a great way that we can help alleviate concerns with that. Um, it's very interesting how the flow of our staff have evolved with this curbside. Um, we actually have one person on each of these separate physical teams where they, we call them our air traffic controller, <laughs> Um, or just overall kind of uh, circus ringleader. Um, so they are helping just everybody stay in communication of what pets wear and what doctor needs to move on to what pet, um, those kinds of things. But also this person is taking a picture and or video of every single pet and mid appointment that is getting texted to the client. And clients are loving that. Um, a lot of your third party communication platforms will offer um, one way or two way texting. Um, but even simple as you can just get an extra, if you have an extra iPhone or you can just get an extra line um, associated with your practice. Um, and we have, we have one and we've had one for years because we actually communicate um, to our clients this way through our hospitalizing for post-surgical um, patient care is, is via text message. And clients have really liked that for years now. Um, but that can be something that you can turn on. You can turn that on on Monday. You know, you can turn that on tomorrow if you need to. Um, so texting can be really, really simple, if, even if you're not currently set up with that. Um, I have actually um, utilized FaceTime quite a bit in my interactions. I've done this a lot with my new clients that are coming to us for the first time. And particularly if it is a challenging case or is a case that has concerning prognosis and I don't have that relationship, I don't have those few minutes to look this person in the eye and say, I need to talk to you about something that's very serious about your pet. We have to make some decisions. And the only wrong thing is to do nothing, is to not make a decision for your pet. That would lead to suffering. Um, and I sometimes really, really want to do that looking at somebody's face. Um, so FaceTime has been really easy. Um, that's really simple. Uh, you just need to ask a client if they have an iPhone. Um, if that's not an option, Zoom is really easy. That's the platform you're using right now. And it's super easy. Some practices have gotten really savvy and they're actually using Zoom to video the entire visit. And how cool is that, that the clients really get to be a part of it? That's, that's the ultimate. Um, Kind of pie in the sky, um, you know, that to make them included in that. So we've got to nail the communication to the client and it's got to be repetitive. Um, but also communicating as staff right now are really, it's really, really important. Um, some things that we're using, um, the group me app is allowing us to text um, as a whole group and that's really, really easy. You can use it completely free um, for most of uh, the organizations that are our size as privately owned practices. Uh, Slack is another app that is free. It's, uh, some people like that because it doesn't quote unquote blow up your phone like texting does. Um, it'll be, it'll simply be give you little notifications that um, there's communications happening and you can make um, different groups. Slack is also free, I think up to 10,000 messages. So um, you would have a long time to be able to use that. Um, Zoom is a great option. Again, you're on this platform right now, uh, particularly when there is this physical barrier, if you're running two separate teams like my practice is. And then um, the one I have underlined is huddle. Right now, physical face-to-face -face communication is really, really important. And it, we can talk ourselves into how hard and impossible that is in a veterinary practice. Um, I have to make sure I don't talk myself into how impossible it is, but a huddle can literally be three to five minutes. It can be hardly any time, but it's just, hey guys, just let's 
come together as a group, everybody um, who's on shift. Sometimes we were doing huddles well before COVID and um, our practice is so big that we would honestly just be happy if we could have a representative from a department. So if I had three receptionists, uh, on the clock at that point in time, I was happy if I could just get one of them in the huddle, same thing for techs, the same thing for doctors, because then we could at least get somebody voiced, voicing something from that department and also that could go and communicate it to counterparts um, later throughout the day. But it's really, really important that we um, leave some space for physical face-to-face -face conversation um, again, give people a, a short opportunity to weigh in. Hey guys, this is what we've got on the dock today. Um, how, did, how did we think yesterday went? Um, what are some of our goals today? Um, do we have any high fives to give out? Um, which for us, those are just anything we want to acknowledge as, as a positive, whether it's something a person did or um, a case outcome. Um, but those are really, really important right now. So, just to recap, we talked about safety and how that has got to be really the first order of business. How are we helping our staff and our clients feel safe? I'm not promising that we can eliminate all danger here, but how can we help them feel safe? Then we talked about being agile as, a, as an organization. And we talked about how we're going to communicate the agileness of our decision making and the safety precautions we've got. Our fourth topic here is transparency. And this is, now is the time, guys, now is the time for radical transparency. I love this quote from Ray Dalio. He is um, really a titan in uh, the Wall Street space. Um, but this quote here, radical transparency fosters goodness in so many ways for the same reasons that bad things are more likely to take place behind closed doors. And that just resonates so true for me right now. Um, when I talk about radical transparency, here's the things I'm talking about. If you are worried, it is okay to share that with your staff. You do not have to shoulder all of this alone. All right. That doesn't mean we're going to go into our organizations like, like, and, and purposely try to incite fear. But right now, I am looking my staff in the eyes and say, guys, you know what? One thing you can take to the bank is that I'm going to be really, really, really honest with you right now. I'm going to let you know what's working really, really well for us. And I'm also going to share with you some of the things that are concerned. Because I may need your help to figure out how we're going to get through this. And that level of vulnerability is... So empowering for so many ways. Um, this is a screenshot from a tool um, that is available to all of us. It's completely free and such a gift from Vet Success. Who they have no idea that I'm even speaking about it. I literally stumbled on it on Facebook. Um, Vet Success is a company that will help you track data in your practice. Um, and it's usually something that you have to subscribe to in order to get that, but they created this tool and it's updated every single afternoon. So this is today's stats. And the reality is that this is hitting the veterinary profession. We are seeing definite dips in revenue. We are seeing definite changes in the number of invoices that are coming through. And this very well may just be the start again. I am not here trying to be a fear monger, but it is really important that we be transparent with our staff, that when we have these conversations about how are we going to get through this now and how do we get through this if this lasts four weeks, if this lasts six weeks? Again, we don't have to have all the answers. We just have to have the questions as a group. Um, but this is something that you can, sh a resource you can share with your staff. Um, it's also pretty cool because if your practice is beating the odds, it's something you can celebrate right now. And that is really important to focus on as well. But the website to get to this tool is right above here. Um, and that will be shared in the presentation um, in the Fear Free Toolbox as well. But transparency is just awfully, awfully important right now. And I can't tell you, I, I've had probably four 
different support staff members that in the last two weeks kind of pull me aside and they'll, you know, they're thanking me for how we're getting through this. And the number one thing that they're thankful for is they're thankful for the transparency and they're saying, you know what, I've got friends, they work in other practices, they are scared. They're scared. They're not being told all the information. Um, I've all but told our staff, like what's in the practice's bank account. I haven't said the exact number, but I've given them, they have a clue. Um, we, I, we go over the end of day revenue numbers every single day. And you know, if it's something that was a great day, then we get to celebrate it. If it was something that was concerning, we say, okay, here's what we learned from, here's what we can try to do differently. Here's what we can communicate differently. Maybe we need to be more clear that we're open on social media, whatever it needs to be. Um, but we can do that together if we are transparent with, with what's going on. And the final tip to really be successful through this is gratitude. And that can be something that is hard right now. Um, it's funny. Um, and I tell my team this all the time, that this is a time where it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to fall apart. It's okay to have an ugly cry. It's okay to not have the answers. Um, it's just, we can't let ourselves stay there too long. And, you know, when we find ourselves in the spots, and I, I've been there, um, I have not been okay at different points through this. And if I'm being really transparent, which I just talked about how important that was, I had a really, really, really hard time when I saw the handwriting on the wall that we were gonna split into two separate teams. Was probably one of my lowest days as a practice owner. Um, and you know, I get that for some people, they're like, what is she talking about? Why was she so stinking upset about that? Get over it, lady. Um, I, I get that. Um, but, um, you know, for the last five years, um, building a strong team has been the primary professional focus of mine. I do still see patients. I do a lot of surgeries. Um, but more than 50% of my time as a practice owner has been devoted to building the team. And, and um, it's been a learning journey for me. I've learned a lot about how the human brain works, how it, um, how building a team works at the neuroscience level. And I am very, very aware that a physical divide is going to have lasting negative consequences that we will have to repair. And it just was really, really sad. And it took me by complete surprise that in such a short time, uh, I literally was put in a position where in order to protect them, I had to divide them. So for me, that was a really, really low point. But what it made me, what helped me get through that was realizing how much I had to be grateful for. That what a strong team we were that I was so sad to break it in half. Wow, how powerful is that? Something else that I find um, I am so grateful for right now is just the simple act of bending down, starting an exam, getting my hands in the fur of that pet, beginning to palpate those lymph nodes, beginning to um, check for any lumps or bumps and palpate that abdomen and listen to that heart. The familiarity of that and the straightforwardness where, you know what, if gonna, I find a bump, I'm gonna document the size it is, I'm gonna aspirate it, then I'm gonna look at that under the microscope, then I'm gonna be able to continue to follow my normal medical algorithm for how I deal with all of these problems. There's a freaking algorithm. How cool is that? I'm so grateful for the um, simpleness of that. Um, and again, for me, that familiarity is comfortable right now at work. And I think that um, it's really important that we bring that spirit to our teams right now. And um, I'm, I'm really tired. <laughs> I'm working like a dog. And so, uh, you know, sometimes I wake up and I'm like, oh my God, uh, and I find that I'm um, in a half, I, I have to mind. I have to, oh God, I have to go to work and I have to do this 10 hour shift and basically do two jobs in that, which is leave my 
my practice and also treat patients for 10 hours straight. And I, you know, take a few minutes every morning to just think about, you know what? I, it's not that I have to, it's that I get to. I get to do this. I get the opportunity to examine these patients. I get the opportunity to lead this team. I get the opportunity to be part of this profession that so many times that I've heard is recession resilient. I don't like the word proof, but recession resilient. I don't know that I've actually believed it until now, until finding out, well, oh my God, we're essential. Oh my God, you know, the, the dining industry is decimated. The service industries are decimated, but veterinary medicine is still essential. We still have work to do, guys. And that's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. This um, is three categories of um, positive attributes that gratitude brings. And this information comes from a 10-year study out of UC Davis. Um, and you know, all of us think a little bit differently. So some of us maybe feel like this concept of gratitude is a little bit touchy-feely. Um, so I love that there's actually science behind how important it is and that it can have physical, psychological, and social implications on that. Um, but, you know, no matter what your role is in your practice, your choice to bring this attitude of gratitude to, to light in that space is going to have uh, a, a, a ripple effect. You know, sometimes we think about leadership as a title. And I like to always remind myself, remind my staff, remind anybody that I'm talking to about it, uh, that leadership is far from a title. You can say that you are the manager or the head of whatever and actually have very little clout. Nobody really wants to follow you. In order to be a leader, you have to have a follower. You have to have somebody that is influenced by you. And I've got people that are very, very influential in my organization. They can flip the mood of that for good or bad just by their mere presence of walking in. That's how influential they are. They might not have a leadership title. They may be a technician. They may be a receptionist. They may be an associate veterinarian. But like it, whether I like it or not, they're super influential. So, you know, no matter who you are, if you're watching this, you can bring this to your practice and really have a positive outcome with that. Um, so that being said, this aspect of gratitude, it's something that I work on. I work on this every single day with every single client that I talk to right now. And they're all on the phone. The very first thing that I, as soon as, as soon as they pick up when I'm calling them, and this is I've examined their pet, um, and now I'm either giving them the results of the exam or going to recommend some further diagnostics. The very first thing I say is, hi, this is Dr. Eck. Thank you so much for bringing Hudson in today. He is just so lovely and it has been such a pleasure to see him. And thank you so much for trusting me to take good care of him today. Do you know how much that sets the tone for how this conversation is going to go? I mean, it, it, it gives you so much power. And you know what? Now you've got somebody who, you know, just heard that and it's like, oh, well, gee, you're welcome. Um, and I'd love to hear what, you know, what's going well with Hudson, what's not going well. And they're so much receptive to your recommendations when that happens. Um, and literally every single day, um, I actually have a personal goal where I express my gratitude. Um, right now, I, I'm doing it to the group that I'm physically in, because I don't get to see the other group. Um, but for my Team A counterparts, I'm making sure at least once a day, I tell the entire group. And then I have a personal goal that I connect individually with three people every single day to at least have acknowledged something that they did that was wonderful or thank them or be grateful for them somehow and um, really striving to make that something that we can all work for with that. But thank you guys so much. Definitely want to open it up for questions. I'm an open book for how we're handling this.
Thank you so much, Dr. Reck, for sharing your experience and your perspective. Sure. So I've got three questions for you. Uh, the first is um, someone had posted a question about how the two hour pre-appointment text reminder is sent out, whether that is something that is somehow automatically done or yeah. if a CSR, another team member is manually sending that reminder. That is a great question. So we are using a third party communication system called Ally DVM and that is automatically sending those text messages out for us and that's making that much easier if i did not have that option right now we could do that through our just our clinic cell phone um, and i would certainly i think it's been a valuable enough asset that if i was maybe scrambling to get that set up we would do it another way um, I'm not up to speed on every single platform. I think that a lot of them have begun to develop this two-way texting capability. It's something that I think Ally DVM came out with like six or eight months ago. Um, and it took an additional, you know, there's a normal monthly subscription to all of these third-party communication tools. And it was, I, I please don't quote me on this because I, I can't quite remember, but it was a, a little bit extra a month. I want to say maybe like 70 bucks more to begin this two-way texting ability. Um, the nice thing about that is that, that those texts are saved in Allied DVM, not in our practice management system, Cornerstone, but we can go back and access all of that communication right in Allied DVM. So, technically still counting as a patient and communication record. And it's something we can easily access as opposed to text messages that are getting, just getting lost in the data stream on a cell phone. Okay, great, thank you. The next question comes from Diana and she is looking for any advice on taking a potentially location aggressive pet out of the car that they are guard, essentially guarding. Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the things that we have begun to utilize is, um, again, in our robust communication with the client, we are asking for their help. Um, so we are actually having, uh, and we also felt as a team that pets hiding in the car and then having to get very into the car and into this space of the client, which is a concern from the coronavirus standpoint, but also really not ideal when we're trying to get patients out of, out of these recessed areas um, that tends to lead to bad encounters. So we are actually having the client get out of the car and stand there and hold their pet. And it makes the handoff of the pet very fast. Of course, our technicians have already taken the history and basically I've already said, I'm gonna come out and get the pet. Um, and that has gone really, really well. Remember to be forward thinking with that positive reinforcement. So they're going out and they're going out in their PPE gear, but it doesn't mean you can't have a little um, a dose of peanut butter or a treat or something along those lines that we can begin right away. Um, and for the most part, that handoff is going really, really well. I, some practices, have the physical space where they have kind of a vestibular area. I think that that's a real advantage right now. So some practices are using that vestibule. Um, they're either moving a cage bank that uh, has been in a, another animal ward um, so that small animals can go in the top, a big animal can go in the wide open cage bank. They're having a client put the pet in that cage bank or they're just having the cat carrier be placed right there. Um, so those are some strategies that can help. Um, again, with the peanut butter, one thing that um, I actually talk about in my general fear-free lectures is that we have, um, we order from Amazon, like a box of thousand. They're just like a little condiment jar. It's clear plastic, it's got a little plastic top. And we actually pre-prepare, um, you know, I think it's like two or three tablespoons of peanut butter that fit in that little condiment. Um, like it's almost like a little ketchup or mustard holder. And that is really convenient for 
um, walking outside to have available for the pet to interact with right away, as opposed to like a tongue depressor or a pretzel rod with peanut butter on it. Okay, great, thank you. I have two questions that pertain to PPE and cleaning from Megan and Carolyn. So one is just wanting to know what you personally require your staff to wear. Um, and if you are re maybe the disposable masks with clients, I'm not really sure. I, I'm not sure I completely understand that question, unfortunately. Um, and then there was mention of additional cleaning protocols and they would like a little bit more information about that. Yes, great questions uh, on that. So our staff are going out and collecting the pet right now. They're going um, with a surgical mask right now, which admittedly doesn't necessarily protect the staff member, right, from contracting it. Um, it does help reduce our staff from transmitting it to the client. But that being said, the one area that that still does protect us as staff members is helps us remember to not touch our things. And that is actually way more likely to cause transmission. You know, if we have shaken a hand or touch the client or touch something that the client had and then forget to wash our hands and then we touch our nose or mouth, most likely way that we're, we're probably going to transmit it. So they're going out in masks, they're going out in gloves. Um, Again, no clients are coming in the building. Um, we have, um, we are putting our own leashes on the pet. Um, so none of the, uh, we're, we aren't taking the collar off the pet, but we aren't um, taking the leash in and out of the practice uh, from the client. We've got, there are these blue and white nylon leashes. Um, and in between every single patient, those leashes are going into a, um, kind of a tub of disinfectant. I think right now what we're using for that is trifectant because we can make a very, very large tub. It may also be the concentrated rescue. Um, we, have, we have both because I was afraid that one would be <laughs> unavailable to order right now. Um, and I think that rescue did get put on allocation. Um, for those of you guys who haven't been familiar, Rescue is the fear-free preferred disinfectant. Um, it's the accelerated hydrogen peroxide technology. Cool thing about that is that it doesn't have a chemical smell that incites fear, anxiety, or stress. Um, and uh, honestly, the number one reason I brought it into my practice about four years ago is the rapid uh, rate of kill for contact time. Um, within 60 seconds, it is bactericidal, virucidal, and fungicidal, and works really, really well on uh, the flu virus and the coronavirus. So um, rescue has been a really, really effective option for us. Um, but when I got scared 10 days ago that that was going to become a bit of a problem, um, because the rescue is relabeled, it's used in dentistry, it's used in human medicine. So uh, I got really concerned about how available that was gonna be, we brought trifectin in. So to be honest, I can't, I couldn't tell you to, as what was in that bucket today, it was either trifectin or um, the concentrated rescue that was diluted. Um, but we are disinfecting the leashes in between um, all of the patient interactions there. If we have the, again, the only time the client's physically coming into the building for euthanasia, is for euthanasia. Um, we are using extension sets so that we can be six feet away from the pet and the client during that time span. Um, and we are having the client uh, wear a mask. We have a few of the N95 masks. I wish we had more of those. If you do have some of those, there is a um, way that those can be reused and re-disinfected. They're not autoclave, it's actually through, um, they're, they're actually baked in the oven, like a normal household oven. Um, so be sure, do not throw those away right now. Um, when we are using those, those have a better rate of protection for us to not get, by wearing that mask, you are more protected uh, from that. So we are trying to wear those in the middle, in the midst of euthanasia 
um, I'm actually leaving my surgery mask on and then putting the N95 mask over that. That's really just to keep the mask clean so that we can uh, reuse that N95 mask as much as possible. And I wish we had enough that we could give every single person that. Um, we just don't have that supply at the moment uh, for that. Okay, thank you very much for that. Interestingly, um, rescue, and I don't remember what they call it on the human side, but they really became um, a leading force in disinfection in their Canadian company, and it was with the SARS outbreak, and that was yeah. essentially what Canada used to disinfect the country <laughs> um, during the SARS outbreak. Um, so yeah, I imagine it's probably hard to get right now. Um, that said, we just have two more questions, and then we're going to need to wrap this up because we are just two minutes shy of nine o'clock uh, Eastern time. Um, the first question is, about scheduling appointments and if you altered how long those appointments run to accommodate for what might be a little bit of extra time going back and forth between the car to get and bring back the pet and along that same vein uh, question was was worded as did going to teams a and b result in decreased hours for individuals I know that might be a little bit tricky for you to answer, Dr. Reck, because you actually did cut back on your hours. So I would imagine that it was nearly impossible not to have some people's hour affected by that. But we'll, we'll have you address those two questions and then we'll wrap it up for this evening. Absolutely. They're, those are really, really good questions. Um, Remind me what the first one was again. <laughs> the oh, first sorry. one was just, um, did you have to change the length of your appointment times uh, to, yes. to accommodate okay. the new curbside? Yes. Um, so we, prior to this, ran 30-minute appointments, and we are still running 30-minute appointments. And we are able to pretty much honor that time span. Um, of course, if a pet you know, was here for vomiting, and lethargy, and this becomes blood work and x-rays. Uh, of course, that appointment's going well beyond that. Um, the client was informed of that, and they very much understand that you're constantly working on this pet. Um, so they're looped into that. Uh, but it's really, it, I think that's a really, really good question because it is taking us a little bit longer. Um, and it's, it's interesting because we normally have, um, probably on any given weekday, about three or four people in the practice that are either running marketing in a leadership role, maybe they're creating schedules, something along those lines. So they're not actively part of the appointment making process. And um, as of right now, everybody is, it, it's just literally all hands on deck. So I think that for me to correctly answer that question, I need to be honest with the fact that we are still able to meet that uh, that 30 minute expectation. Um, but I think the only reason we are doing that is that we've been able to pull people in to helping with this um, that would normally be doing more administrative things. So if you don't have that right now, you might want to consider booking out every 45 minutes. Remind me what the second question was again. The second question was, um, how has all of this affected your team's hours? And, mm, yes. and it wasn't, it, the, the, excuse me, the question was framed around, you know, dividing them to teams A and B, but you had that, but you did also actually cut back your clinic hours. Yeah. Admittedly, the hours you're now working are a little bit more typical for a sure. small animal practice. Sure. Um, yes, that, this is really interesting, and I would be happy to provide, I can add an additional uh, slide that actually gives a rundown of how we broke this schedule down, um, but basically each team is operating in a two-week time span 70 hours, which it would technically be a reduction for our full-timers. However, they have the option to arrive at 7.30 in the morning. Um, that's traditionally when our morning team first arrives. We don't open till the public till eight o'clock, but we are open at 7.30 for surgery drop-offs um, and things of that nature. So by the time you factor that 
30 minutes in, it starts to bump things up to maybe 34 hours. And um, also we ended up consulting a payroll attorney. Now I'm in South Carolina, so I believe that this gets quite specific from state to state. But our question was, because technically we're running 50 hours one week and like 20 hours the second week, because the way that the, the way that the work week falls with the Sunday, it's just a little bit odd. Um, and we were able to find a, we mimicked a schedule that has been adopted by um, 911 operating teams, which was, which has been very uh, helpful because um, right now, to me, a being off on a Tuesday is no different than being off on a Saturday. Like a weekend is no weekend, right? There's nothing to do. There's nowhere to go. <laughs> um, and most importantly uh, for myself is, you know, just, I just want to create a system that allows me and my team to not burn out, that we can get through this COVID time period um, with a balance. Um, but it doesn't really matter to me if I'm off on a Tuesday or a Saturday. I got reminded by my team that that is not how everyone feels because some people um, will have spouses and counterparts that are still working a nine to five Monday through Friday, but they're able to do that remotely. Um, so for them being not working every single weekend is really important. So the cool thing about this schedule, and I'll be happy to share this, um, how this works is that um, basically you, work two days or off two days and then you'll work three days and then you'll be off two days and then you'll work two days and then be off three days and that whole thing kind of is a rinse and repeat for the two week period um, but we spoke to the payroll attorney because um, it's a little bit unclear uh, the words healthcare are thrown around as to um, who is excluded from needing to pay overtime um, if you're not exceeding 80 hours in two weeks, um, but it's related to healthcare, um, the fact that there was 50, you know, technically 10 hours of overtime on that one week, do we need to pay overtime with that? And the answer for us uh, in our particular state is we do need to pay overtime. So um, it's interesting. It, it still breaks out just a little shy of our normal payroll. Um, to pay that 10 hours of overtime. And by the time they're able to, if they want to get to maximize their hours as much as possible, if they clock in at 7.30. Um, so it's been a tiny bit of, a, of an overall reduction, a tiny, tiny bit for the whole staff. Um, we talked about this as, as a team. We, again, were really transparent with the team about how difficult it was to, um, you know, come up with a schedule. We, we showed them the one that we thought would be the best fit, which is this um, one that mimics 911 operators that um, we have someone who was married to one and she was able to show us how, how they worked this out. So it was extremely helpful. Um, and we showed them two other versions of what we had tried to come up with, but none was ideal. Um, uh, so everybody got to kind of weigh in on, on ultimately the schedule that we went through um, and we were very transparent with that this technically does reduce, uh, will reduce your hours a little bit. Um, and that is just happening in order to create a balanced schedule, not because we are in a financial predicament where we would need to do so. And we promised them that we'd be honest if, if the need for that did come up. Great, okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Rick. I really appreciate your time. And again, sharing your, your experience and, and what's worked for you and the acknowledgement that if we asked you to do this webinar next week, it could be a completely different discussion. So, oh, could be. Yeah, so again, um, again, thank you everyone for joining us. We'll go ahead and close this webinar out. So thank you all very much for being here.